Hi guys, this is Adam with Contest Prep University. I'm here with Dr. Corey Probst, and today we're going to talk about how to handle a binge. Mm, yeah. I can't even count how many emails, probably weekly, I get about this, which Me neither. is probably very comforting for our audience to hear because that's one of the big things that I get when people, you know, does anyone else do this? It's almost like a oh, secret. Yeah. Thing and people just feel so defeated by that. And it, it's very normal. And uh, I think what's most important is how you react to it, correct? Yes, and this is a yes and sort of response, Adam. <laughs> I think that if it's so common, it's really valuable to ask, well, then why is it so common? Rather than just dealing with the aftermath and learning how to respond to it, maybe we need to ask the question, why is it happening in the first place? Mm -hmm. And work to prevent it. Yes. So we actually know that the primary cause of binge eating is severe food restriction. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so <laughs> we are literally, when we choose to prepare for a physique contest, putting ourselves in the worst possible position to binge eat. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think one of the big things is identifying why it's happening and um, the signs and symptoms that come before it. And, and, you know, like some people will say like, well, I had blackout binge and it was all of a sudden, but you know, usually you have some signs and um, just some body language that's happening internally before that blackout binge actually happens. Mm -hmm. And I think just recognizing those uh, signs and symptoms and behavior, um, you know, hunger is a neurological cue, but it's very easy to get mixed up with anxiety or even depression um, because your your body just does get really confused with what some of those signals are so sometimes people binge when it's anxiety versus actual true physical hunger as well yeah and i think it can get really confusing because if we are in a severe state of food restriction um we're already putting ourselves in the position to experience more depression and experience a greater level of anxiety Significant hunger uh, can result in all of those things, and those are the body's cues of saying, eat food. So it, this is a very difficult position because the goal is to lose body fat. The, you, you're choosing food restriction in order to do that. And so all of those things that you said, Adam, to make complete sense. And at the same time, what we're doing is we are literally saying, when we start prepping, I am going to not listen to my body's cues anymore in terms of hunger and mm -hmm. satiety. Because typically we're eating by the clock, we're eating by macronutrient ranges, right? We're not eating according to biological hunger, physical hunger, and that can manifest in many different ways. It's not just your stomach growling. Right. You know, when you get <laughs> created a new word the other day, crangry. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We know, we know hangry, right? It's because this happens to me a lot. I'm not the only person that, that this has occurred with. You get so physically hungry and your blood sugar is so low that you just start crying. Like, I know I'm not the only one that has experienced this. Right. But so in terms of the signs and symptoms, yes, you're correct. Typically there are some, but when you're in that much of a biologically deprived, restricted state, you're not even cognitively in a place where you're going to be able to pay that much attention to the signs and the symptoms. So first of all, I would say, Maybe choose a contest that doesn't require you to restrict food to such a degree that you are just starving all the time. <laughs> That's going to be, first of all, in your best interest. Give yourself plenty 
of time. And I know we're kind of, we're getting off how to man handle a binge, <laughs> but mm -hmm. I think the, the preventive part of this is really, really important. Give yourself plenty of time. Second, have a discussion with your coach early on at the very start of a prep and discuss what you can anticipate. Again, we've agreed upon the fact that this is an extreme sport, right, Adam? Like, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Not very many people do this. Probably a good thing. Not very many people do it well um, or in a healthy manner, I guess would be a better way to say it. Um, and I don't know that severe food restriction is ever a healthy thing, but this discussion is really important because the coach and the client need to be able to convene and collaborate around what this is potentially going to feel like. And it will often happen, often happen in stages in terms of that sense of like drivenness to eat and that preoccupation with food is going to occur for the majority of people who do this. I can't tell you how many times um, I didn't do this because I know it was, I wasn't in my best interest while I was prepping. Oh, I'm going to watch hours and hours of the food network. <laughs> you're already food obsessed because right. you're hungry, right? <clears throat> And your body biologically is saying, eat all the time. And then we go watch the Food Network, and now we're, we're making that sense of drivenness um, even, even worse. So what can you anticipate? And then being really honest and forthright with your coach, and hopefully you have a coach who is willing to shift food levels shift you know times or days or however many days during the week and of course you know your your progress is going to kind of dictate how often changes are made in terms of how much you're you're eating but um hunger levels for you to be able to share with your coach how you're feeling hunger and energy wise is super important when you agree adam like Absolutely. you want your client to be able to share that with you. Yeah. It's a, one of the most important things, just as much as if I give someone too much volume on a workout and they're like, Adam, I'm right. on real sore, you know, um, the same with dieting. I just want to make sure I'm not pushing someone past their potential of what they're capable of. Right. Yeah. Because there is, there's, it takes practice to be able to weather the emotion that comes with a prep and it takes practice to weather and know what to do with the thoughts that come up during a prep that, mm -hmm. you know, drive you towards food, what to do with those. The, the other thing would be to, if you actually do end up in a binge, remember that it's not your fault. This is not personal. This is your body actually <laughs> trying to protect you from again, starving. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing. The second thing is you're gonna put yourself in a much worse position if after a binge you severely restrict again. So a lot of times people will binge for two reasons. To get rid of the thought about binging because those thoughts can come like they can feel incredibly rampant and never ending. And like, they're screaming at you, like, go get food, go get food, go get food. And the binge stops them. The binge quiets them. So the binge, you know, puts you in a place where the thoughts stop for a little while. But then the second area of risk is you have a binge, you engage in a binge, and then you severely restrict again. Okay. Well, I had that. I'm, I'm super uncomfortable. And you either compensate in some way um, by, an, you can, a lot of people do a number of things. They purge, they use laxatives, they don't eat, or they try and exercise it off. So these mm -hmm. compensatory measures are incredibly dangerous because 
once you start severely restricting again, now you're on the path to the next binge. Mm -hmm. So don't restrict, guys, and don't engage in any of those compensatory measures or behaviors. You are, you're really hurting yourself by doing that and setting yourself on the path for another one and for that to become a pattern for you. So really start eating normally. <laughs> that, tell your coach what happened. Don't try to hide it. It's really important that we acknowledge it. Don't shove it away in the dark. Um, avoiding telling your coach and having some communication around it is not going to be in your best interest. Um, and hopefully they're going to advise you well and advise you to not restrict again. Mm -hmm. Would, uh, how do you handle it, Adam, with your clients? Yeah, a lot of my clients, I think most of them do try to exercise it off. I just had that email with somebody today and they're like, how much cardio should I do make up? Yeah. And I said, actually, I'd suggest the opposite, that we actually maybe raise food intake and just let you get your feet back under you for a bit mm -hmm. and then see if we can diet down. And we actually did move her show back because... That's super she, smart. Yeah. Yeah, she's not quite ready. And I think she just needs more time, um, especially with the show being in four weeks. If you're... You know, sometimes if they're two weeks out, that might help them just be able to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. I said, let's uh, let's push your show back eight weeks and just slow down a little bit. And, and cool yeah, that. do you find Adam when? And I know, I know your approach, and I really respect it because it's never forceful or commanding or demanding, and. It doesn't threaten your client's sense of choice and autonomy. Do you find that a lot of times though, when you suggest let's push the show back, um, there's some resistance around that. Like, no, I have this date and this goal and everyone is counting on me and my family has this on the calendar and that there is a little bit of pushback a lot of times. There is. And, you know, it's funny you mentioned that and everything you mentioned came down to outside factors. Yeah. So doing what's best for you. And in this particular situation, um, I have a lot of people doing the show and she really wants mm -hmm. to be with the team. And I said, but we're going to make you struggle to make everyone else happy. I yes. said, that's not good for you. And, and she thought I would be disappointed. And I said, I'd only be disappointed if we don't bring your best. And um, right. yeah, all outside factors. So you have to do what's best for you. And mm -hmm. that's really um, key. I totally agree. And that leads to a few of my final points, which are to offer yourself some compassion during this time. Again, binge eating is, this is not personal. This does not mean that you are defective in any way or weak. Are there some skills perhaps to be learned? Yes. And let's acknowledge that you're, you can't fight your body. <laughs> Biology right. is really strong and stronger than you are. Your mind yeah. can be. So forgive yourself, don't do anything extreme. Ad acknowledge the, the brain and the body's natural instincts like we talked about, because your body is, your body's not trying to hurt you. I think we often end up in this place where if we binge, it's like, one, what's wrong with me? Two, I hate my body that I can't get this body fat off or whatever as we're trying to shrink and change our bodies. Your, your body's caring for you. Um, and so I think that we can practice a sense of body respect as we're going through this process as well. And we can use the prep process as an opportunity to, to practice mindfulness. So this is what I was getting at earlier, which is let's use this time to begin to understand what our minds are doing and the thoughts that our minds are making 
And rather than becoming attached to them and looking at those thoughts as directives for our behavior, just kind of take an outside perspective, like we're watching a movie that is our mind. And it's saying this, and I'm out here, like on the outside watching it um, non judgmentally. And so I think that in terms of like you said adam the the cues or the signs and the symptoms so you guys know like symptoms are on the inside these are things that not anyone else is going to see <laughs> so right. like you know your heart beating faster and um tension in your chest you know um tightness behind your eyes like all those things internally that might indicate to you that there's been a shift in energy or a shift in emotion and then the the signs are the things on the outside that your family or your partner might notice even your dog because <laughs> they're <laughs> they're pretty intuitive like my cat knows when i'm experiencing sadness or you know we change our bodies our bodies literally change when we're experiencing emotions so practice rather than getting yanked around by them um watching being an observer of them yeah yeah definitely and i i think it's uh, just so important to recognize that this is just as uh, simple as you touching a hot pan and you taking your hand off it's just reactive and it's protective yeah, yeah. so I agree awesome <clears throat> Well, this is a great educational video, so I really <laughs> I hear a lot of a, a lot of people watch this. So, thank you so much for your time today, and uh, we'll see you guys next episode on Contest Prep University. You bet. Thanks, guys.